This video is to cover some basic verifiable facts which need to be taken into account to determine the very shape and nature of the world. For most, this is an open and shut case without any sort of investigation necessary because we've all been raised to believe that the world is a spinning sphere and assume that there's no debate to be had. We've all seen the Apollo films and we've been taught that the conventional explanations for our reality, including a spinning spherical Earth, gravity, the solar system, galaxies expanding as a result of the Big Bang, and so on, uh, if the Earth is indeed a spinning sphere, there shouldn't be any difficulty proving it as such, and there should be all sorts of verifiable evidence in line with the heliocentric hypothesis. In terms of scientific observation, we should have no trouble proving the world as a spinning sphere, and we should welcome any inquiry into the shape and nature of the world, as inquiry is indeed the crux of the scientific method. Science was never intended to involve ridicule of alternate hypotheses, just as it was never intended to shut out lines of inquiry intended to prove or falsify any one school of thought or question any particular model. By seeking answers to fundamental questions involving any subject of inquiry, we can only come closer to the truth, and this is the fundamental purpose of the scientific method in the first place. Scientists should absolutely never become emotionally attached to any model or school of thought, especially when said model is mostly theoretical, and the tenets of which are only proven by circumstantial evidence. Unfortunately, this is exactly the situation we're facing. Science has become so emotionally attached to the theoretical model of a Big Bang universe where our world is a spinning sphere, uh, when a toy globe becomes scientism's favorite model, and the Ivy League degree-toting parrots become emotionally and monetarily attached to the toy, it renders them biased observers, mentally and emotionally incapable of simply considering factual, obvious evidence which completely disproves the foundations of their school of thought. As a result, conventional contemporary science has become increasingly ignorant of any evidence or related hypotheses which disagree with their beloved physical models, as they are held very dearly by the mindless repeaters of theoretical physics who will stubbornly ignore any theories, evidence, and ultimately hard facts which disagree and ultimately disprove the so-called conventional wisdom. It's, I, I do want to point out that the story of, of the rise of the, what I call the standard model of particle physics is, a, is much better than any man-made myth. And it's, it, it, as you'll see, it's a sublime mixture of culture and technology. And it also suggests, once again, that not only are you insignificant, which you are, I hope we got that out of yesterday, um, but that, in fact, we are just a cosmic accident and it could have been quite different. Who's this guy? Everyone knows who that guy is. Okay, Albert Einstein. Now, I get letters every day from people who, um, who tell me that they have a new theory of everything. And, and want me to explain and want me to read it, which I don't do. Uh, and and they and they what and the standard line I get a lot is, you know, most people, most of my friends think I'm crazy, and people I give this to think I'm crazy, but everyone thought Einstein was crazy, so they figure that if people thought Einstein was crazy and people thought they were crazy, they must be Einstein. There's some kind of transitive thing there, and um, but more important, they say. I have shown that all, everything we now know is wrong. All of the science that we now know is wrong. My theory is right. And that's exactly, and just like Einstein, I'm revolutionizing physics. And then, of course, when you read that, if anyone ever says that to you, you can stop listening. This creates a rift between science and the truth, which results in a sort of mass cognitive dissonance between the dogmatic, scientifical pontificates and the very process which defines the field of science. If a theoretical physicist is inherently unable to discard a failed theory such as heliocentrism or evolution, the scientific method is rendered useless and becomes a social tool that reinforces an overzealous religious cult masked in the guise of an unbiased science. Ergo, the mindless masses, this one here included just six months ago, are led to believe the preposterous theorem of the cult are indisputable facts, 
largely because of their purposefully distorting the understandings of the subject at hand and the assumption that theoretical physics is somehow scientific, which it absolutely is not. The scientific method involves demonstrable, repeatable, conclusive results which either align with any given theory or falsify it. The very first point which can be easily demonstrated is the total absence of curvature here on the world. In order for the entire heliocentric model to work, the world must be a sphere with a diameter of just under 4,000 miles, with a distance around the equator as roughly 25,000 miles. Using spherical trigonometry, the amount of curvature necessary on the sphere is boiled down to necessary feet of curvature. You can square the distance in miles and multiply that by 0.66666 to infinity, the end result being in units of feet of expected curvature. There are other ways to calculate the expected curvature. However, I found the method I just mentioned to be accurate enough and a little bit easier than the others. The other most popular equation for expected curvature is multiplying 8 inches by the miles in distance squared, which is just as accurate but renders the result in inches, meaning you must divide the result by 12 to translate inches to feet. One thing is for certain, if you Google search the equation used to calculate the expected curvature of the Earth, you'll find an array of erroneous equations involving multiplying the distance in miles, not the distance squared in miles, by 8 inches. So I'll just give you a quick example and I'll read this from Math Central. Suppose the Earth is a sphere with a radius of 3963 miles. If you are at point P on the Earth's surface and move tangent to the surface a distance of one mile, then you can form a right angle triangle as the diagram. Using the theorem of Pythagoras, A squared equals 3963 squared plus 1 squared equals 1570530, and thus A equals 3963.000126 miles. Thus your position is 3963.000126 minus 3963 equals 0.000126 miles above the surface of the Earth. 0.000126 miles equals 12 times 5280 times 0.00126 equals 7.98 inches. Hence the Earth's surface curves at approximately 8 inches per mile. Okay, so even a moderate competent student of high school level mathematics would realize that the equation mentioned on mathcentral.ca is describing a slope, not a curve of any sort. Since the pictures from NASA show the world is perfectly spherical, just as spherical as the sun or the moon, we can conclude that regardless of the terrain, the face of the earth must be a nearly perfect curve. If you can imagine standing on a sphere and facing in any direction, such curvature would be pretty obvious, especially if you had the ability to gain altitude above the surface of the sphere. However, the conventional wisdom will tell us that we cannot gain enough altitude to begin to observe any curvature, and that privilege would belong strictly to the Apollo astronauts of NASA back in the 1960s. You really like it, You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black if I ever thought of it. Saying I misrepresented get myself. away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. You're a coward and a liar and a now, I'm not going to waste everyone's time listing each and every lighthouse in the world. However, a casual observer or researcher can easily confirm that lighthouses are documented and even advertised as being visible from distances which are theoretically impossible, given the supposed size of the Earth and necessary expected curvature. You realize this is because of the world being supposedly a sphere, and even a lighthouse on top of a tower should have a measurable distance of visibility where the curve of the earth would come to meet the light waves and completely obstruct any chance of a distant observer viewing the light from the tower beyond a specific calculable distance. Furthermore, in modern times we have an abundance of radio towers in our modern society that are living, breathing testaments to the world's utter lack of curvature. Radio waves are light waves that are beyond the scope of visible spectrum. Radio waves behave much like light waves, but on a frequency that is undetectable to the human eye. In order for two radio towers to communicate, they rely on a direct line of sight and operate by sending and receiving large packets of information via the radio waves. The engineers and technicians responsible for configuring and maintaining such radio towers will often remark how they've successfully completed radio shots exceeding 70 miles and even 110 miles when the visible range of such a tower should render such shots completely impossible on the spherical globe Earth model. 
even when factoring in the elevation of the towers and the unpredictability of refraction, there's no logical explanation for the radio towers and lighthouses being in direct line of sight over such vast distances, completely shattering the assumption that the world is any sort of sphere whatsoever. People will argue that if the Earth was actually a plane as opposed to a sphere, then we should be able to see clear from the east coast of the United States over to the coast of Europe. This is, of course, ridiculous, as the subjective laws of perspective prevent us from seeing beyond the vanishing point here on the ground, which is demonstrated by observing distant objects near the ground which eventually merge with the horizon, exacerbated by our thick atmosphere becoming opaque and reflective at relatively close distances. In other words, even if the world was totally flat without a hill, valley, or wave in the ocean, which there obviously are, but even in that case, the human eye can only see a certain distance when peering parallel to the ground. The laws of perspective and the nature of our atmosphere prevents us from seeing to infinity on the infinite plane Earth. People also argue they can see curvature of the Earth from an airplane window. However, this is an optical illusion caused by the same subjective laws of perspective, which are directly related to altitude, topography, and atmosphere. The horizon line becomes more and more distant as altitude is gained, but even with the angle of attack being from tens of miles high towards the distant horizon, it's still beholden to these factors. Again, that would be topography, altitude, and atmosphere. At certain altitudes, or even on very flat surfaces on the ground, the horizon line is a complete circle 360 degrees around the observer. This indeed creates a viable illusion of curvature, However, when studied objectively, the plane of existence isn't wrapped around any sort of sphere whatsoever. Passenger planes, including the Concorde, use convex glass, which acts as sort of a fish-eyed lens and adds to the illusion of curvature. What's more, we have plenty of footage taken from weather balloons launched 30 and 40 miles into the air, which demonstrates conclusively that the horizon line continues to raise with the observer even to such altitudes. This proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that we could not possibly live on any sort of ball. If you're unfamiliar with the shape of a sphere, as you gain altitude, the horizon line should begin to fall away from you, the observer, and such a drop in horizon should be abundantly clear from 10 miles up, no less 40 miles up. The simple fact is that regardless of how hard you seek it, you will never find evidence of one single degree of curvature on the face of the Earth. Since the basic premise of the heliocentric model involves the world being a spinning sphere, we could actually end the discussion right here, and a proper scientist would begin to search for an alternate hypothesis to account for observable facts. Unfortunately, science has indeed become so far removed from the scientific method that we must continue to show further evidence that the accepted model doesn't adequately explain the natural world we have always lived on. Another open and shut case of evidence which demolishes the conventional heliocentric model is the fact that the North Star Polaris is visible directly above the North Pole all year round. Globularists assert that the North Star is in alignment with our so-called axis of rotation, and the vast distances involved cause the North Pole Star to remain fixed in that position, and our orbit around the Sun doesn't cause any change in the parallax. This might sound like a logical conclusion, however, if you dissect the model, it becomes painfully obvious it is a huge fallacy. The first way globularists will try to make this observation work in their model is to show the rotational axis of the non-existing spherical Earth as sort of skewing in towards the Sun in order to keep Polaris perfectly fixed above the northern axis. This might make some degree of sense, however, since we experience seasons in reality, we must also have a rational explanation for seasons in the heliocentric model. So it goes, the seasons are supposedly caused by the rotational axis of the Earth being fixed in its angle, so that the bottom portion of the sphere receives an equivalent amount of sunlight to the northern over the course of a year. So, since during the northern summer months, the southern pole is experiencing winter and vice versa. So we must strike the diagram where the rotational axis always leans in towards the sun in the north. When confronted with this problem, globularists will then sort of change their diagram and point to another diagram, where Polaris is somehow compelled to remain perfectly above the North Pole, which absolutely makes no sense. 
An observer near the equator can focus a telescope on the North Pole star, and during the course of an entire evening, Polaris will not appear to move whatsoever, night after night after night. This might not seem to be contrary to the conventional model, but indeed it is. You see, if the Earth was actually a sphere, a stationary observer will be facing in totally opposite directions in space when facing north and experiencing the so-called spin of the Earth over the course of an evening. Furthermore, the most damning piece of evidence is realized when the same observer can keep their telescope fixed in the same position to observe Polaris during the winter months and summer months alike, and the other two seasons in between being spring and autumn. There's no possible way for these observations to work on a spinning sphere model, as in order to view Polaris in both seasons near the equator, you would need to look right through the ground at your feet and see straight through literally thousands of miles of Earth to see Polaris at night. This is because we obviously cannot view the stars at daytime, as the sun renders our atmosphere completely opaque. We all know you can only observe the stars at night and never during the daytime. In order for the second diagram to work in the spherical Earth model, Polaris should only be visible from the equator during one season, but of course we can witness Polaris fixed above the North Pole all year long. To take this argument even further, the heliocentric model claims that while the Earth orbits the Sun at around 666 miles per hour, the Sun is also supposedly orbiting the galactic center at over one half million miles per hour. If you're not familiar with what a path of orbit should be, it should be a parabolic curve. This means that the stars overhead during the summer months should be a completely different set of stars during the winter months, the North Pole star definitely included. The most simple way to put this is, observable reality doesn't match up with the heliocentric spinning Earth model whatsoever. People will hurl insults at you for pointing this out. They will state that you are anti-scientific, moronic, etc. However, unfortunately, the exact opposite is the truth. Being anti-scientific would entail a person who puts blind faith into a set of beliefs and will never stray from that belief system even when it's a demonstrably false stance. So the fact that we see these same stars all night long, all year long, and from year to year to year proves conclusively that the Earth is not a spinning globe. A scientific mind will base their belief system on observable reality and demonstrable, repeatable facts. Such a person will never become emotionally attached to any belief system and will follow the evidence wherever it leads. Since the world demonstrably possesses no curvature, and the North Star Polaris being visible above the North Pole all night, all year, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, we can safely assert that the heliocentric model is indeed incorrect, and should begin to search for alternative hypotheses to adequately explain physical reality. In this respect, theoretical physics has become a religion, where its followers and pontificates will continue embracing a false picture of reality because their position has become that of a totally ignorant religious zealot. At this point, by proving very simply and logically that the Earth doesn't possess any curvature, nor orbital motion, nor rotational motion, we could honestly stop the conversation here, and a true scientist should begin to search for alternative theories to account for such observations. Unfortunately, we're not dealing with a community of science that is beholden to the scientific method, but instead we're dealing with a scientific community which relies on religious dogmas designed to ostracize dissent and brand anyone who questions the accepted assertions as a heretic. I should point out that this is the opposite of science, and I think it's important for people to understand that by subscribing to the heliocentric model without inspecting its tenets first, it proves that they are blindly following a religious cult of ideas which have been proven as totally fallacious. Another way to prove the world itself is completely stationary involves the duration of airline flights. You can ask any pilot and they'll certainly tell you that there is no difference in flight times flying west to east. However, once I've brought this point up in videos in May, when I did the search in May, the flights from New York to LA and back were equivalent. If you do the searches now, the eastbound flight is faster than the westbound flight, which is indeed the opposite of what you'd expect if the Earth was spinning towards the east. People will say you don't understand physics if you point to a westbound flight, say, from New York to L.A., being identical in duration to its return flight as proof of the world's complete and utter lack of rotational or orbital motion. 
Unfortunately, it is they who don't understand physics at its most basic and fundamental level. Their argument will entail trying to explain the face of the Earth as a fixed frame of reference, which might work for objects fixed to the ground, but even then it doesn't apply to our world in the slightest, but we'll give them that. We'll give them the f fixed frame of reference. When you're talking about airplanes that are no longer connected to the ground, however, then a fixed frame of reference goes right out the window. When calculating distances of flight from point A to point B, the distances are always given in terms of units of measurement on the ground. So, from New York to LA, we're talking about roughly 2,500 miles between the two airports on the ground. The point is, you cannot state that the ground is a fixed frame of reference when the ground and fixed destinations are supposed to be traveling about 750 miles per hour towards the east. You must realize this is because the world is supposedly spinning once per 24 hours. At the equator, all destinations should be zipping eastward at a rate of over a thousand miles per hour. On the other hand, if you were standing at the North Pole on a spherical spinning Earth, you would be spinning at around half the speed as the hour hand on a clock, discernibly not spinning at any rate whatsoever. So, given these necessary rates of travel on the sphere Earth, New York and LA would be constantly traveling around 750 miles per hour, give or take. When the plane taking off from New York heads west, for every second that the plane is not connected to the ground and accelerates in the opposite direction as the spin of the Earth, the destinations would be racing towards the plane, and the plane would also be racing towards the destination. A westbound flight from New York to LA would be very short indeed if the face of the Earth was in fact spinning 750 miles per hour east at that latitude. On the other hand, the return flight from LA would need to race against the destinations to keep up and arrive. Globularists will state that you don't understand physics if you point this out. However, that is an intellectual cop-out and a wild, unfounded insult designed to make themselves feel comfortable about their religion and their intelligence, which is lacking at best. If you take the time to consider this fact, that the two flights are equivalent in duration, sometimes, if the plane leaving LA was indeed spinning at the exact speed as the ground before takeoff, the instant the plane lifts off the runway and begins to propel itself east, the race between the plane and the destination would begin. As the plane begins to gain altitude, it would slowly start to slip out of that eastward frame of reference, as it would necessarily travel across a larger arc, and therefore would need to travel at a greater distance just to apparently remain fixed to that eastward velocity matching that of the destination. Furthermore, even if you concede for argument's sake that this assertion is a possibility, which it isn't, the assertion being that the eastbound plane would remain fixed to the frame of reference as the destination, but the simple fact is that the two flights are often identical in duration. Even handing them that one for argument's sake, the two flights could never possibly have even a similar duration on a globe where the destinations are constantly racing east. You simply cannot have a fixed frame of reference which is constantly traveling over 750 miles per hour eastward when the two flights are not connected to the ground and the airplanes are propelled through the air by their own propulsion. One of the laws of motion is an object in motion will tend to maintain its velocity until enacted upon by some other force, and of course we could consider several jet engines attached to the plane as some other force. Westbound flights, again traveling in the opposite direction as the spin of the Earth, should be extremely short flights, as they would only need to travel a short distance through the air in the opposite direction as the spin, since the ground below, along with the destination, would be racing towards the nose of the plane constantly 750 miles per hour, with the plane racing towards the destination at about 500 miles per hour west. The three points I've just described obviously and completely prove the world couldn't possibly be a spinning sphere of any sort. This conclusive evidence that cannot be argued against except by illogical assertions of those who are emotionally attached to a spinning sphere Earth and the religion of scientism, it really can be a difficult thing to let go of for them because we've all been programmed since childhood to shut down our rational thinking skills. The other reason it's hard to let go of the picture in our mind of a blue marble, courtesy the lying freebasins of NASA. Speaking of artwork, NASA has allegedly sent men to the moon more than a half dozen times. We supposedly have probes that have taken pictures of the outermost planets of our solar system. I believe at least one has allegedly left our solar system. Yet when you do a search for Earth from space, you find very few authentic pictures of our own planet.
and the ones you do find are either totally fabricated, are made to represent something that is not true, like my wall mural, or are composites of high aerial photos combined with not so skillful Photoshop editing. Why? I mean, if if we can allegedly get full shots of the massive gas giant Jupiter and wonderful pics of Saturn and its rings from a variety of angles, why are there so few full-sized and unaltered pics of our own world? To make matters worse, when fabricating the blue marble pics of our Earth, they can't even get the proportions of the continents or color of the water consistent from one rendering to another. And I've got two pictures right there taken from NASA's website, allegedly of our planet. <laughs> okay, these are supposedly authentic pictures of our planet. Now I, got, I see some major problems with these pictures. Um, looking at these two pictures, in the one on the left, you get the sense that America is massively huge on our globe. Uh, according to space.com, the image on the left is, quote, a blue marble image of the Earth taken from the uh, VERS instrument aboard NASA's Earth Ob Observing Satellite, uh, Suomi NPP. This composite image uses a number of swaths of the Earth's surface taken on January 4th, 2012. And I've got the source for that link if you want to check it out. You can go right to that link and uh, advance to pick number four. The NASA.gov website describes it the same way here, and I got the link to the NASA website that shows that same picture there, the one on the left. Yet according to the same website, the pic on the right is described this way. So on the same NASA website, it describes this picture right here as follows. Today, April 22nd, 2014 is Earth Day. And what better way to celebrate than taking a look at our home planet from space? NOAA's GOES East satellite captured this stunning view of the Americas on Earth Day, April 22nd, 2014, at 11.45 UTC, 7.45 AM EDT. The data from GOES East was made into an image by the NASA NOAA GOES project at NASA Goddard. And there's a source for where I got that right there. You can read it for yourself. <laughs> At least they're being honest. And they're telling us that these are composite images that are being made by artists who are clueless when it comes to maintaining consistent proportions and colors. Then to make matters worse, we have this alleged time-lapse video of our Earth spinning. Check this out. Time-lapse video, supposedly of our Earth spinning. Notice anything wrong with it? Keep watching. Notice anything wrong with it? There goes Africa. Africa's going by us here. Going all the way around. Okay. Now, the description for this video, it says, NASA JPL, Jet Propulsion Labs, description of the first frame from their photo journal. This color image of the Earth was obtained by Galileo at about 6.10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on December 11, 1990, when the spacecraft was about 1.3 million miles from the planet during the first of two Earth flybys on its way to Jupiter. The color composite used, color composite used images taken through the red, green, and violet filters. South America is near the center of the picture, and the white sunlit continent of Antarctica is below. Always got to make sure you get that picture of Antarctica, right? I mean, here you got Antarctica. See, we're proving it to you. Antarctica's a continent. See, you got to have to show that. We always got to take it so the picture shows Antarctica. Um, picturesque weather fronts are visible in the South Pacific lower right. This is the first frame of the Galileo Earth spin movie, a 500-frame time-lapse motion picture showing a 25-hour period of Earth's rotation and atmospheric dynamics. I didn't see any dynamics. <laughs> Talking about weather systems, yeah, you got clouds there, but they're not moving. This is supposedly a time-lapse video of a 25-hour period of Earth's rotation, and yet none of the clouds are moving or morphing at all? Seriously? So I'm standing approximately 100 feet above sea level and about 50 meters away from the sea. Okay, so I'm here in uh, Whitby in England 
and this is a vantage point that offers the best viewpoint for the horizon line uh, for a long distance from here and as we can see it's flat on the horizon line so uh, it's flat so this is England and uh, we've got London down here and if we follow this blue line up uh, to the road network it takes us to Whitby Whitby is approximately 250 miles north of London and I'm going to return back to this map of Whitby in a moment it will all make sense now the dog that you see on screen there is approximately a hundred feet above sea level and if you happen to be out on a boat at the horizon then this hundred foot elevation is clearly visible when looking back at the land from the sea I've paused the video on the horizontal as you can see it's egg shaped so you can't twist or turn it and it's spot on level continuing with the video you can see at a glance that the horizon is level and if I pause the video here the horizon line is millimeter perfect with the level usually you'd put the spirit level above on top of the surface like this but it's harder to make out so that's why I put the spirit level slightly below the horizon it doesn't matter because uh, both sides of this level are equally spaced and it gives the exact same reading so that doesn't really matter I'll spare you the trigonometry but uh, the distance across the horizon relative to the picture you're, you're looking at is between 20 and 30 miles the actual horizon line you can see with the naked eye on a clear day would be about a hundred miles from this particular location the camera I'm using has a wide angle lens of 24 millimeters and it's not got a fisheye lens uh, that curves and bends everything so the images you're seeing on screen approximate what you'd see with your eyes with the exception that your eyes can see a lot wider than this video the blue marble was used in every textbook and documentary to show us the world from the vantage point of the Apollo astronauts halfway to the moon during the 1960s missions if you take the time to critically dissect the blue marble image just that image from NASA there are obvious telltale signs of fakery including the use of clone stamping the clouds why would NASA need to fake the images of the Earth from space if it in is indeed a spinning sphere? Why don't we have millions of images and real animations of the Earth from space if we have thousands of satellites up there sending and receiving data? NASA loses all credibility when you realize there are extremely dangerous electromagnetic fields containing radioactive gases and more recently discovered plasma tubes in the lower magnetosphere as discovered this year, 2015, at the University of Sydney by Cleo Loy. NASA didn't take any steps to prepare for such elements during the Apollo missions, and they've never traveled beyond the 400-mile mark since the Apollo missions. Of course, the Chinese Space Agency has alleged to have traveled to the moon more recently, although there are other problems with their story and their footage, which is beyond the scope of this video. Suffice to say, if the Apollo astronauts were lying about the moon mission and the Earth is demonstrably a stationary plane as opposed to a sphere, we can logically conclude that the Chinese lunar mission was also a public spectacle designed to siphon wealth and energy away from the Chinese population and perpetuate the lie that we live on a spinning sphere. So, if you take the time to consider the three main points raised so far in this video, any logical person can easily conclude that the Earth is certainly no spinning sphere. It's really quite obvious, actually. Unfortunately, we've all been essentially brainwashed since childhood to believe a fantastic lie, and we'll hold fast to the lie in order to preserve our sense of intelligence. Again, this is the polar opposite of science. You see? And people believe this stuff, folks. They believe it. Yeah, bullshit. But there's some problems with this film. I'm going to play it. Because I can tell you now. In the battle of the roundheads against the Flat Earth Cavaliers, the roundheads think this film is great. 
they think that this film has put to bed forever the flat earth argument. Oh, they've been oh, hailing this from the highest possible mountain, as though this is going to prove beyond any doubt, and we're all going to now be quiet, because this now shows what we've been asking for. This is what they're saying. Here you are, flat earthers. This is what you've been uh, asking for. Right, and here it is. This time produced by the Japanese space agency from one of their weather satellites. Right. Firstly, notice how still the shot is. I mean, there is not a not a not a teeny weeny bit of shake. It's perfect, right? It's obviously spinning at exactly the same speed that the Earth rotates. There is no movement either way, right? It's clearly um, a time-lapse video, but there's problems with it. I mean, all the weather systems appear to be moving round about the same speed, if not exactly the same speed. And I speeded this up, by the way, because I wanted to have a closer look. It's difficult to tell when they're all moving very slowly, but when you speed this thing up and get it really going, you'll see that they all appear to be moving at the same speed. Now, the ones right on the periphery, right on the edge, right where the curve should be, they should be virtually standing still. They are that far away from the storms directly underneath the, uh, the camera. They should be hardly moving. And yet we see them moving at a hell of a rate, the same speed as the storms right in the center of the screen. So that doesn't make sense. The other thing is, right, where is the bloody stars? Now, I went to visit this video and I read all the comments. And the roundheads said, oh, no doubt the, you know, the flat earthers will be saying, where's the stars? As though that's a daft question to ask. It's a perfectly legitimate question to ask. I mean, where are the stars? Where are they? Well, they say, oh, it's... Uh, light pollution, you know, it's uh, too bright, too dark, yeah? Um, no, it's bullshit. There is not a single object on this film apart from the Earth, which is nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Where are the stars? That's a legitimate question. Where are they? Right? The other thing is this folks where is where are the satellites why don't we see satellites the thousands of satellites you're looking here at approximately 50 percent of the world of the ball earth right the globe and yet i don't see a single object on there crossing across the screen left, right, up, down, yeah, diagonally, top to bottom, bottom to top, not a single bloody object. There's thousands of satellites, and yet we don't see a single one. And by the way, you would see them, because they would reflect the sun's light. I mean, we're told, aren't we, that we can see ISS and this, and this kind of thing because it's so bright, because it's reflecting sunlight. Well, we should be able to see lots of little objects very, very, very brilliantly lit up by um, reflecting the sun's light. So we should see on there, um, albeit very quickly, of course, we should see lots of little objects whizzing about. What about all the space junk? Where's all the space junk we're told that's up there? Where is it all, folks? I don't see any. So there's no satellites, not, not one, right? And as you're looking at half of the Earth, well, you know, we should see some, surely. There's thousands up there. There's all the space junk. I don't care whether it's lower. That's completely irrelevant. We should see something. We don't see anything, right? They're completely invisible. Every single satellite and every single piece of space junk, then, right, is completely invisible 
to us from this uh, picture taken from this satellite? Is that what you are telling us? Because I ain't buying it. It's bullshit. This is where I speeded it up. And you can see that all the weather systems, from the ones right in the centre, in the middle of the ocean, to right on the edge, all appear to be going at the same speed. Which, guys, is nonsense. It is nonsense. Right? So, we've still got no spinning Earth. We've got no stars. No objects on there apart from the Earth, so there's no satellites, no space junk, right? We've just got this ridiculous uh, CGI. I mean, it is an amazing CGI, but I, I would expect nothing else from the Japanese. They are brilliant at this kind of thing, far better than the Americans, obviously, which is probably why they've done it. But there's something else, folks. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's something else. Uh, Mr. deGrasse Tyson. What did he tell us about the Earth? Uh, what did he tell us? Well, he said that uh, it's an oblique hemorrhoid. Sphe uh, spheroid. Sorry, I was thinking of something else then. Yeah, and then what did he say? Well, it's like a pear. Yeah, it's like a pair of bollocks is what it is. I have no problem with people blindly clinging to false doctrines on faith. However, I do have a problem with said faith masquerading as science. When pressed, most globularists will ultimately point to one or two proofs of a spinning sphere, either gravity or the Coriolis effect. Yes, you heard me right. Even after being presented with clear, indisputable evidence which proves the world could not possibly be any sort of spinning sphere, they will point to observations which have been crammed to fit the globe model as proof of the globe model. To me, this is beyond comical, as the scientific process is designed to test viable theorem. The scientific method is not supposed to involve pointing to observations and related theorem to prove a hypothesis, which is clearly shown to be out of line with all verifiable reality. What I find even more comical is the fact that the Judeo-Christian Bible clearly states that the world is flat and stationary. The scientific community has often laughed at evangelical Christians over the years, since the Bible is clearly a flat earth book, pointing to this supposed mistake as proof that the Bible is a lie. When you finally realize that the world is indeed flat and stationary, it proves that the Christian Bible is accurate, at least scientifically speaking, and that the scientific community is composed of blindly faithful followers of a religion which is demonstrably false. So, to quickly cover the two main arguments of globularists, being gravity and the Coriolis effect, we can crush any semblance of a viable position which is believed to be held by the apostles of scientism. The observation, what goes up must come down, is clearly accurate here on the ground. The first point to make regarding this observation is the fact that this observation is certainly not exclusive to a spinning sphere Earth, and really doesn't make much sense on a spinning sphere Earth. What goes up must come down is a law of physics here on the ground. However, for a person to connect this observation solely with the heliocentric model is intellectual folly. What goes up must come down certainly works on a stationary plane far more soundly and logically than on a spinning sphere, and for a few glaring reasons. If you hold a pen at arm's length and let go, it will fall to the ground. Ask yourself, how does this work on the globe model? The scientific stance on this involves the mass of the Earth warping space-time, which essentially causes the equivalent of surface tension in space, which is a vacuum full of nothing. But in turn, the surface tension of space-time uh, pushes back down towards the face of the Earth, causing the object to fall to the ground. I should point out that the already proven laws of density and buoyancy are adequate to explain this on a stationary plane model. However, I should also mention the fact that the world is demonstrably not a spinning sphere, therefore downward falling objects are in no way exclusive to a spinning sphere. In fact, the hypothesis of gravity is so very illogical when you scrutinize it to any degree. For one, as you stand at the equator, you are supposedly traveling perpetually eastward along a great parabolic curve around the face of the Earth. With the supposed warping of space-time creating an equal and opposite balance to the outward thrust generated by a spinning object known as centrifugal or centrifugal force. 
if the amount of gravity pushing down on a person at the equator spinning at the given rate was applied to a similar person standing at the North Pole who would be spinning half the speed as the hour hand on a clock, the same person would weigh many thousands of times more at the North Pole since the outward thrust would be completely nil and the overwhelming force of gravity would not have any equal and opposite resistance to nullify, rendering the observer at the North Pole as a pancake. On the other hand, if the person weighing 175 pounds at the equator is balanced out by the inward push of gravity, and the outward push of the spinning Earth, then a much more massive object at the equator should apparently get lighter and lighter. This is because the centrifugal forces exerted on an object by a spinning body will increase with mass. So everyone knows that as an object's mass is increased, it gets heavier and heavier, meaning it's pushing down towards the Earth with more force. Now, this is the opposite of what you'd expect in terms of centrifugal force, as the weight of an object should decrease as its mass is increased. The repeatable experiment to prove this point, which anyone can do, is pretty simple. Take two objects that weigh a single pound, one in each hand, and stretch your arms out to your sides. If you begin to spin, you'll notice an outward pull of the two objects on your shoulder blades. Now, if you replace the two one-pound objects with two ten-pound objects, one in each hand, and do the same thing, you'll certainly notice the heavier objects tugging out on your arms with more force than the lighter two objects. This is exactly the same thing you'd expect on a spinning Earth. However, we know for certain that the weight increases with mass even at the equator. This is but another verifiable proof that the world is not a spinning globe. All of the evidence proves the heliocentric model is a hypothetical fantasy that is so far removed from reality it's really very amazing they were able to trick the entire world for the duration which they did. The only way they've gotten away with it for so long is because they've hijacked our minds at the youngest possible age and inserted so many falsehoods and related programming it becomes nearly impossible for even an intelligent, rational person to realize the truth. They never would have gotten this far if our school systems were designed to teach the actual scientific method as opposed to science as an infallible set of dogmatic ideals. I could go on proving points about the world, and I've done so in many previous videos. Uh, the other point that globularists will point to is the Coriolis effect, which essentially doesn't apply to the spinning globe Earth. The Coriolis effect is uh, easily demonstrated if you and a another observer sit on opposite ends of a merry-go-round. As the thing spins, if you try to toss a ball to the person opposite you on the spinning merry-go-round, the ball will apparently curve in the opposite direction as the person, depending on which way it's spinning. If it's spinning counterclockwise, then the ball will apparently fly off to the right, and if it's spinning clockwise, the ball will appear to fly off to the left. Mainstream science asserts that only weather systems and some snipers at very long ranges are affected by the so-called Coriolis effect. This is a rather silly explanation for observations on the ground, because this clearly shows the airborne ball as immediately slipping out of the fixed frame of reference, which is rotating on the merry-go-round upon being thrown. So once the ball is thrown, it no longer remains fixed to its, in the above example, counterclockwise spinning motion. If the two airplanes in the beginning of this video considered in a similar manner to the ball in the above example, which is always used to show an example of the Coriolis effect, which is supposedly proof of the Earth being a spinning sphere, it becomes clear that the self-propelled airplanes would certainly not remain fixed to the ground below, as suggested by all globularists. So the Coriolis effect is essentially pointing to the same problem that I pointed to with the east-to-west flight times duration, and that would be very close to the Coriolis effect on a spinning globe Earth, but in fact the two flights are identical in duration. There shouldn't be any shame in having an inquisitive scientific mind, but unfortunately our culture has made us think that way. We are taught to assume that anyone who doesn't adhere to the pre-approved model of the world doesn't understand physics, but again, that is the opposite of the truth. 
I am personally very familiar with science, math, and physics, which is why I advocate each person considering the points laid out in this short video. I hope that each and every one of you watching is able to realize the Earth is not a spinning globe. It never has been and never will be. The Earth has always been a stationary plane, however our perception of it has been systematically distorted for our entire lives. It is only by letting loose of those piles of assumptions and false pictures in our mind given by NASA do we stand a chance of understanding the truth of our world. I personally believe the scientific method is an adequate way to understand the truth. However, we must stick to it. We must discard hypothetical models that don't jive with the observations of reality, and we must explore the world with a fresh set of eyes in order to get it. We can no longer assume the world is a sphere and use the presupposition as a foundation for experiments to prove the shape of the world being a sphere. We must rely on repeatable, verifiable facts and experiments which will always prove the world as a stationary plane because a stationary plane it is. This means the entire Big Bang Theory is a complete misunderstanding and we must revisit previous models to understand the truth. If the Judeo-Christian Bible contains tons of passages that point to the world as a stationary plane, perhaps the Bible was accurate in some of its other tenets. I would much rather subscribe to a religion which claims to be a religion than subscribe to a religion that claims to be science. Science is a process to understand the truth empirically. Religions are often a set of dogmatic ideals designed to teach us morality. When a religion teaches us to be immoral and masquerades as science, then we have a false religion filled with false doctrines and a big problem. I call this religion scientism and even heliocentrism, which for all intents and purposes teaches us to worship the sun. When you realize that most religions prior to Christianity were indeed sun-worshipping cults, then it's not a far leap to assert that modern scientism is indeed a cult full of sun-worshippers. If you choose to worship the sun, that's fine, to each his own. However, if you trick the entire world into worshipping the sun under the guise of science with false pretenses, while the students are still in their formative years, then I have a problem. Even the atheists of the world are very much entrenched into this religion of scientism. It's a cult, and they don't even know it. I find this a bit comical, but a little bit depressing.